So we're going to get to take a little memory trip or a trip down memory lane. So the reason why I kind of say this is, again, we're still in the machine learning section, but specifically why I call this a, a trip down memory lane is we are being presented today with an algorithm near and dear to my heart because this algorithm was my master's thesis. No, I did not invent it, but I had to use this. This is a, essentially like... This was step one of my research when I was doing facial recognition stuff. So, hey, you know, and I'll, I'll go ahead and give you a little cheat. You know, at the end of the slides, we will kind of dig into it a little bit now that we've sat down and had our brains melt with more math. So, again, the entire idea, right, remember what we're talking about. We're in the machine learning space, and specifically, one of the things that we had talked about is sometimes we want classifications, but sometimes we also don't really have a classification, but that's also not what we're looking for. Sometimes what we're looking for is something known as a regression. I'm trying to find a trend. I'm trying to identify a pattern. And so the big issue is, remember, when I started kind of talking about decision trees, you know, one of the things that we had as an issue is what happens if I have a bunch of attributes? What happens if I have 500 columns worth of attributes, right? That's a lot. Uh, I know that there are certain, well, how many did we use? For the face, we used, I, hold on, how many, I got to, for the face alone, I used uh, 84 landmark points on the face. That doesn't sound like a lot, and it wasn't. In fact, that was a smaller set of some of the bigger ones where there are over 200 points on the face. Well, the problem is, think, just 200 points, as you're doing maths and calculations and trying to do your entropies and all that stuff, it's so much. And so the big issue is, can we reduce it down? 200 you know, data points is too much. So can I do what we call dimension reduction? Can I shrink down those 200 attributes? Can I shrink down, you know, all of this stuff that may have, you know, again, trends to it? Or there's influence, not influences, there's some, can I find out if there is some form of correlation or covariance or dependence from one attribute to another attribute? And again, that's what, dimension reduction does, right? So this is a nice little example, right? Someone taking PCA, principal component analysis, and saying, well, hey, let's study the dietary habits of Nepalese adults. Because once again, you know, we, we have sort of a, an obesity epidemic out there in the world right now, and we're trying to identify it, right? We have what we know, but there's also, let's do it with math, right? And so Again, if you're looking at all of these different food groups and you collect a bunch of journals from people, uh, here's what I ate today, here's what I ate yesterday, blah, 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 here's my biomarkers for weight and height and everything, you might be able to run dimension reduction to then identify different styles or patterns of someone's or of uh, the population's diet. That's the best way I want you to describe it. So again, if we're looking at it, we have this first observed pattern. Uh, again, you know, it's kind of healthy. So lentils, fruits, vegetables, some fatty foods, some noodles, tea, coffee. Okay, fine, right? But then as we sort of look at other dietary patterns, okay, well, notice, again, what you're seeing here, if you, you got to squint really hard, but uh, some of these numbers are bolded, right? And those are indicating that these are the most prominent attributes for this group of people. And so the second category, notice, it's uh, the high values, the things that are, uh, again, really high values going in there. Oh, that's fast food, sugar, uh, soda, right? 
kind of a fast food pattern. Uh, then you've got some different ones, and you can see this one's just about uh, grains, meat, fish, uh, or in alcohol. Uh, and then the last one's just solids, solid fats and dairy, right? One of the things that I'll say is like, as you continue to go down these groups, it's not that these are individual people, right? It's not that this is like one subset of people. This is one subset of people, one subset of people, one subset of people. It's not that. It's much more like these are the, the v- different valences or values or spectrums that a, in a single person's dietary habits exist in. So specifically that first pattern, right, it's one person. This has the most shift between people. Then this secondary, again, obesity, if you're trying to kind of look at it from all Nepalese adults, well, the second identifier was whether or not they ate fast food or not. And then that spectrum, right? It's not just yes or no. It's how much are they eating fast food? How much of that is your diet? Uh, but... That, that's the part, you know, I just kind of hand waved, you noticed? I, I, I highlighted it, and then I never said those words. What's a hyperplane, right? What's a, huh? What are those big fancy words? Here's how I like to understand the hyperplane, okay? So the entire idea to this optimality of hyperplanes is Let's just imagine for a second we're on a one-dimensional plane, right? One dimension. I have a bunch of data points on a one-dimensional plane, right? Some of the data points are over on this side of it. Some of them are on this side of it. Now, if you were to draw a line on this picture to separate my different groups, where would that one line be? Yeah, in that big gap in the middle, right? That That is your best indicator of like, hey, here's where there is a clear difference of, you know, groups of my data points. Okay, fine. That's one data point though, right? That's a number line. You learned that in pre-K as a child, as a baby, whatever. Now let's go two dimensions. Now we're starting to get into some of the ugly parts. What happens if I'm dealing with many more data points, but now I'm not just dealing with one dimension, but I'm starting to deal with multiple dimensions. Remember, I said uh, if we think about like the data points on the face, right, that's potentially 80 or 60, 80, 100, 200 different points on the face. So suddenly... When I think about this idea, maybe it's not separate isn't the best word here, but specifically, right, you see a sort of trend. Maybe a shape is coming to you, like a Rorschach test, right? And that's where the idea is, well, where's, like, where are the arrows that would best describe, right, these two dimensions, right, the, the, the spectrum of data points in just two dimensions, Well, again, if we're thinking about this, sure, right? If you looked at that first line that I put on the the image, right, it really does kind of help describe the spread of these data points, but they're only on one dimension. There's obviously a second one where it's not just about the width going on, but about that height going on. And this is where I'm at least starting to add in some of the terminology. First, these are known as the principal components. So that line that is addressing essentially the variance or the spread of that first attribute or that first data point, right? That's here. The second principal component, this you know up-down height sort of describer, that is the second principal component. And notice there's one specific thing that I'm also including here. Orthogonal, orthogonal. Here's the, I hate, I love this word, but I also hate this word because I didn't understand it forever, right? 
orthogonal. Perpendicularity in multiple dimensions. Ta-da! That's all orthogonal means. It's like, hey, I need a perpendicular line, right? Intersecting lines, perpendicular. Now add a third dimension to this. Add a fourth dimension. Add 18 more dimensions to this. That's all orthogonal means. Uh, Right? That's, again, where we're starting to get at it. But the problem is, again, this data, I, I, I did it this way specifically to have sort of that oval-esque shape. The problem becomes, what if this is my data spread now? Right? Oh, right, that's a little different. I can't do the up and down because that really doesn't show the, the actual spread. Right? If I went just up and down, right, I'm, I'm kind of saying that, this is all my data, and that's not any of my data. That's none of my data either. So what happens is what if we took that, again, we took our sort of perpendicular crosshair, right, multidimensional perpendicular uh, vector, if you will, and rotated it. And that's where principal component analysis comes into play. It's trying to essentially find that rotation across multiple dimensions. That's the whole point to this thing. So you can see that's where I'm kind of calling it this idea of an angle. Uh, and there you go. Ta-da! You now understand this big fancy $5 word that I cursed so many nights on, and you don't get to curse. You can curse for me, not out loud. I got a microphone on. My point being, right, why we do this is because what happens if I have smaller hyperplanes, right? Again, think about it. It's multidimensional. It's not just 2D points, but we're also thinking 80 points. Well, some of these may have super teeny tiny descriptions or uh, uh, ways to show the valence of data. If I were to draw, mm -hmm, we'll go green. If I had one data point that was just like here, and specifically I'm drawing it at a, at a much smaller spread, right? There. Mm -hmm. Carry the two. Happy little arrows, right? Notice again, compared to principal component one, principal component two, if principal component three was this tiny, doesn't really, you know, explain a lot of my data. And what that tells me, though, is, well, which attributes are associated to this principal component? And when it comes time to, like, do any type of data analysis or run it through some kind of other type of machine learning model, I could omit those attributes. They're not that important. They really don't give me a say in, like, the identifiability of the data. That's really great. That's the dimension reduction aspect going on there. And so what we're doing with this is we have to start looking at the base level, right? Again, I'm talking about this idea of how much data can I explain with a certain subset of attributes and where are they the most important? So that's where we have to start getting into something known as covariance, right? Variance. What is variance just off the for any of you who do remember your variances. Don't tell me. Oh, please tell me you're going to learn your variance. Yes. Well, yeah, that's the calculation, but like what's it what is the point? So, yes, it's standard deviation squared, but like what is variance kind of describing the data as? Yes. How much does what if this is like the mean, how far does this, you know, actual data point differ from the mean? And so when we're dealing with covariance, essentially what we're trying to do is now it's not just my mean, but also how much do I differ from another attribute? That's what covariance is doing, right? Suddenly if I have something that is a positive covariance between two between two attributes, well, that means if this attribute goes up, this attribute goes up. If I have a negative covariance, as this one goes down, this one goes up, right? So 
They don't, right? They're, they are opposites versus parallel to each other. And then zero covariance is just, oh, you know, they don't impact each other, right? Uh, while zero uh, covariance is a little hard to actually have, like if this one's going up, that one went up, but like not by much, right? That's the lower your variance, the more the the uh, less you're you're impacting the other variable. And so again, as we're looking at this calculation, there it is, right? Covariance. You take your you take one attribute, you take a second attribute, and you run this calculation through it. What is this calculation? Right? Well, again, you're looking at variance. So we're going to be first having to find out the mean. What is the average of, or sorry, that's the average, right? What is that individual data point? And specifically, notice I'm saying how much does it differ from my mean? How different, if this is my mean, how, difference is, how different is this data point, right? Okay, well, then I'm also doing it to the other variable on its mean, right? So how much do these differ from their own means going on there? And you can see it's a summation. Uh, and then we're looking at it from a de uh, um, degrees of freedom standpoint. So how many data points are you dealing with? Uh, minus one, right? So if we're looking at it now, this is where you get to have a little fun, right? I would like you to calculate out the covariance between these x's and these y's, if you were to look at them. Oh, look at that nice little plot there. So, I'll uh, see, this shouldn't take too long, so I'll come back at 3.30. And we are back. So as you're putting your, your numbers in, because, you know, I, I got to as much as I could before I realized I <laughs> can't add. Uh, no, so again, if you're looking at this, right, so at for each one of those data points, you're going in and you're essentially, oh, I don't even have this written correctly, right? You're looking at, well, how far does that data point actually deviate from my calculated mean, in this case for y, right, 12, what's the, oh, that's a, it's starting to dry out. Uh, go back to blank, right? So as we're looking at that 12, that's, a, uh, what's that difference? That's about a 1.4. Ah, oh, that's a negative 1.6. That's a 0.4. That's a negative 0.6. And that's a 0.4. Oh, man. Right. So as we go into now your calculations. Let's see how you did. Okay, all right. So again, we've got, yeah, right, we're seeing those. Right? Uh, thank you for those of you who calculated those. Someone just wrote what I said. Never trust me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then as we're starting to get into the covariances, the 2-2, two, two, right? Um, and so we'll, it, it is the 2-2. Two, two. So if you're slightly off, double check your math uh, on where you kind of went with that, um, specifically in your degrees of freedom. But as we're kind of going through this just to keep on moving, here's where the headaches start, right? Now, okay, you did the calculation on the pairing of X, Y, right? You did the pairing X against Y. But when you're trying to do principal component analysis, right, that was just covariance between two attributes. Again, we're trying to find the spread across and how, you know, the trends between attributes, which means you have to build a covariance matrix. Every single one of your values, every single one of your attributes, including yourself, right, that's just to save you time and effort, right, uh, you have to do those pairings for every possible attribute combination. So, yes, it is a, a little uh, redundant. Not really. I won't call it redundant, but right. 
it's the same value. So this calculation should be the same as this value. So you are getting sort of a mirrored uh, uh, pairing or uh, value to it. But again, the entire idea is to build out this matrix because now that I have the covariances between everything, I can move forward with more math. More math, <laughs> right? So here's the next step, right? I actually almost kind of skipped a step. Uh, before we get to really using that, cover uh, that covariance matrix, we actually have to do a few more calculations. Specifically, we've got to build out something known as our identity matrix, well, our lambda identity matrix. This entire idea is, all right, what is an identity matrix? Let's start there. Yeah, one's down the diagonal. Ta-da, right? The entire idea here now is you're taking that, and this is where I, when I said a scalar, notice I didn't assign a value. Identity matrix, yes, right? Because it's all, it's ones down the middle, right? That part's fine. But then we also, and if you look at the covariance matrix, ones down, right? Those should have zero, or those should have um, a perfect, you know, correlation, right? They are going to be the same values, right? So they should. So where we're going with that is, okay, I'm going to assume then that I have some scalar value. I don't know what that scalar value is. That's the hunt. So notice, again, as you can see, I'm going to just like propose that there is some scalar that I need to find and solve for later. I don't know it quite yet, but I'm gonna start by essentially taking my identity matrix, multiplying it by this scalar value. What does this produce? Again, it produces sort of this scalar identity matrix that I can now hunt for, I can work with, I can interact with. Then what? Well, again, if you were to sit down and do the covariance matrix for x, 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 y, y, x, and y, y, you're going to see specific values. This is why I didn't uh, uh, specifically say that it was a zero covariance, like with x, x, because that's not really the case, right? It's not that they're, the, we're not looking at the difference between the values. We're just saying, hey, like if one value went up, how much does the other value go up? And so Again, with x, right, it is paired to itself. If one went up, it's going to be equal. It's, they're going to go up equally or down equally. They are parallel to each other. But when we're dealing with the xy's, right, notice they go up. Oh, hold on. This is my x. This is my y. There we go, right? x is going up. Y doesn't go up so much, right? And then y by itself, just eh, it's not really doing much anyway. But what do we do, right? Okay, well, that's the covariance matrix. And we're going to take that and subtract that scalar identity matrix from it. Now, y'all have all passed your matrix classes, right? You're all very familiar with trigonometry, linear algebra. Where linear algebra? I don't know where this stuff goes anymore. I just know that it's math. Right? Oh, matrix, right? You know what I have what this is gonna produce. If you don't, you gotta dig up your old math notes. Right? It's just doing differences. And since my matrices are the same dimensions, which they should be, because I built out the covariance matrix and the identity matrix to be the same size with each other, that's gonna produce again now just like, hey, you know, the zeros, okay, there's not gonna do anything. I don't care. But Remember, those are the pairings. That's the xx, that's the xy. Those are the individual pairings. So specifically, you can see I still have that floating lambda that I don't know yet. I don't know what the scalar is, but right, I, I've made my, my simple little, what's the difference? Right? What's the difference between identity matrix and what I've seen in my math? Because then we got to find the determinant. More pop quizzes. What's a determinant? Oh. 
I know. My brother-in-law hated this math question. I had to really help him out here. I don't remember this. Um, I don't remember what it was, but I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Dust off your linear algebra notes. Maybe read through those chapters because you're going to learn we do a lot of your math. We do a lot of that math, right? So the determinant, the entire concept is what you're trying to find, right, is, okay, given my matrix, I'm going to find one of my diagonals, right? You see I'm multiplying all of my diagonals together, or I'm multiplying everything down that top left to bottom right diagonal, and then I'm going to find the difference between the other side, the bottom left to the top right. This calculation here is the determinant of my calculation, right? So. I plug that in, and you notice there's variables, and it's getting ugly, and I am rounding, because brain should be turning slightly gooey about this point, right? And so again, what we find is, okay, you start doing all the freaking math that you had in algebra class all over again. Uh, you see you get like a you know, minus 4.3 lambda times, minus a 1.3 lambda, right? Okay. You know what the next step is, right? You simplify this. You clean this up. You make it look like something that's pretty, and it came from an exam. Okay, right? I, I just added the, the things that didn't have any co uh, or you know variables attached to them, and I combined the things that did have the same degree of variable. And now I'm going to just move it, right? So we're all good. Your brain hasn't. It's still gooey, but you know. Still solid, hopefully. Okay, <laughs> right. I get it. I get it. Right. This is. Uh, I'm sitting this down because again, when I was in grad school, in the lab, four of us poured over this uh, whole calculation, screaming and cursing. Why? Because we couldn't understand it, and we finally got it. We just did that to the paper. That didn't really give us a good explanation. So I fully understand. I'm trying to, yes, <laughs> my point being, okay. Oh, well, you, you know, let, let your, 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 oh, I've seen these kinds of things happen before from your math classes. If this is the calculation you're left with, what do we typically have to do? Solve, solve. Uh, solve for X. Solve for lambda, right? And that's exactly what we're doing. So what we're going to do, right, is we're going to solve for lambda. We apply, you know, say set that to equal to zero. And this is where you got to learn or uh, dig up your, your uh, who remembers their song? Sing it. Negative B plus or minus square root. B squared minus 4AC. <laughs> the mnemonics help, y'all. You just got to enjoy them, right? Oh, but there you are. There's your first value. There's your second value. Now, that's helping, right? That's going to satisfy our determinant in setting that equal to zero. But now what do we got to do, right? Because I now have two potential lambdas to be working from. But here's where you've got some really nice things. You solved for x. You solved for lambda. And congratulations, what you have produced is your eigenvalues. Now, specifically, what an eigenvalue is, is your ranking, right? This is to tell you which one of your values or your, your, your trends, which one has the greater uh, uh, influence, Right? I have two values. One of them is a 5.46. One of them is a, one point, a 0 0.14. Right? So in that case, if we're looking at the ranking, this lambda 2, this variable, right, that is going to be the bigger determiner of variance 
in my trends, whichever, whatever it is, right? I don't know whatever it is yet. I just know it's going to be the big one. This one is going to be the teeny one. It's not going to address as much of the variance. It does a little bit, but not a lot, right? And so this, again, has started to give me, if I look at, uh, again, I'm sort of cheating now. I'm looking at my data as I'm working through my calculation. So again, if we're looking at this, I know I can see that that's sort of the bigger picture. This line doesn't do anything. This is a fake line that I drew. Uh, but I can tell, hey, you know, that's really kind of the big spread, right? I've sort of addressed, I'm, I'm, I'm more showing it versus proving it, right? This principal component, again, okay, fine, right? It's very small. And you notice, again, if we're looking at that data, right, it is linear. I did that on purpose to make our brains easier. But there's not really a big difference sort of at, in this angle, right? In this, we only have this small little window to be operating from, which is good, right? That, again, tells us, uh, you know, that that second principal component is not as important as the first one. Again, it's it's just our kind of way of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Again, ranking them. Good so far? Questions on eigenvalues? Because I know I've threw more $5 words at you, and yeah, I still like hate eigenvalues because I'm like, what, the, what are they for, right? I'm showing, yes? Are you ever going to have components that aren't linear? Oh, yeah, as soon as we add a third dimension. Or a fourth dimension. Yeah. Like, again, I'm, I'm doing two dimensions because it's very easy for us as, you know, people to conceptualize two points uh, on a con Cartesian plane. Imagine if I gave you five dimensions. How do I represent that from, like, a, an instructor standpoint to get you to understand it? How do I represent five dimensions? Oh, well, so in that case, you're, you would be shrinking them down from their five dimensions into a two dimension. I get that. But then I'm trying, again, the big thing is I'm just showing you fifth dimension in a two dimensional plane. That's, again, I, we're answering the same thing here. I just didn't show these other variables that aren't doing anything, right? Uh, this is my, this is my attempt to make at least the math seem a little easier to start, right? I don't need to show the fifth dimension stuff because how do I, how do I, how do I do that? I don't, I don't understand. I will attempt to show you fifth dimensional uh, lines, all right? You ready? Did it? Did you get it? Thank you, thank you. If you did not understand that, you really need to watch the multiverse like saga of the Marvel movies. <laughs> Anyways, my point being, now, okay, fine. All right, we've got our values, right? We have that lambda one. We have that lambda two. We have our eigenvalues, but we need the eigenvectors to really explain. All I know now is just which one is going to be the more important one, but I haven't figured out what the, you know, what the trends are, where the values are. And so that's where what we have to do is now we go back to that calculation, that matrix that we had produced earlier, right, with the subtraction, the difference between the identity matrix and the uh, confusion uh, covariance matrix, right? Because now that we have this, we plug it in, right? We just, we do some plugging. Ta-da. Now, this is where I'm going to hurt your brain a little bit more. Do you remember what you had to do next when you're in a matrix with variables? Salt. You got to salt. Oh, of course we got to salt. Anyone remember... Row reduction. <laughs> yes, we are doing row reduction. So I'm, I, I'm going to be plugging these in for a second. So again, 
I already happen to know those values, right? I plugged them in, there's those values, but again, that's not helping. Here's where the row reduction kicks in. So again, what we're trying to do with row reduction, some people are like, did I just open up like a wound of row reduction? <laughs> no, so again, the big idea here is like, what is the point, right? Well, the point for row reduction in our context is we're trying to figure out which one of those variables are free, AKA they are not a part of this one, or they are not a part of this one, right? Uh, of these vectors, they are not a part of this trend, or how much are they a part of this trend? And that's where also, again, we're looking at it from a de dependency standpoint. Which one of these are more dependent uh, on this trend, on this pattern that we're about to start calculating out, right? So as you go through this, you start to work through this. This is where I'm going to do this, because guess what? I'm not your linear algebra class. I can just do this and run it through a calculation and get the... It, it looks like that, and there's some stuff. There's a, a slide for you to kind of do that whole math for you. I'm going to start jumping ahead. Why? Because I've only got about a, few, a, little, a little bit more time. And you know, again, if you're you're really kind of feeling the frogginess of it, it gets into the reason why is because if you just look at that, like there's a whole lot of math going on here of like what you gotta do. Too much, too much in my opinion. So this is me trying to save some time with my lecture, right? If you really want to keep on digging deeper, feel free to do the row reduction. Uh, but what do I get out of that? Like, what's the point of doing that row reduction? Again, what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to find, right, that th what is this x1, what is this x2? Uh, because they're the same values of the x. What is the x1, right? Look at that. I got two things that need to, that have and interact with x1 that need to be zero. I have two calculations that interact with a zero as well for x2. So I'm trying to identify what those are. Because if I can find those out, that x1 and that x2, again, this is where I'm just kind of, I did that algorithm with hand waving, what I end up with is my eigenvectors. Specifically though, I know it looks, this is where to, what I'm presented with, here's a better kind of explanation of everything, right? So again, as I'm looking at my highest value, right? This is the calculation, this is the most, this is the trend that has the most variance on my data. This is me showing that visually, but now I also have to ask, well, again, what's, I, I, I see that that's the biggest trend. I see that that's the biggest trend. What's the freaking trend? That's the trend. If you, again, we're looking at it from not just a, a, an X value, right? It's an X and Y combination. This essentially becomes some coefficient that I could apply to some X and Y that would let me be on this trend. This second value is my second principal component. Why do we, oh, before I jump into like questions on at least finding that trend. So we did all that math, your brain is mush. Try and scoop it all back into your, your dome for a second. Do you have any questions that don't involve your, your brain being mush? Okay, well. Now I get to the next fun part. Again, this is why this algorithm is near and dear to my heart. I showed you those trends at the beginning, right? I showed you those calculations. That's the eigenvectors, right? So in this case, right, they only showed four of the however many there, of these there are should be equal to however many attributes you have. 
They only show you the top four. Why? Because how many is that? One, two, three, four. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. There are 23 variables here, right? So I should see 23 eigenvectors going on as well due to the math. But the problem is, right, after a certain point, you're not getting really any explanation. It's just sort of the, the, the noise of the data. So I start to trim, right? I don't need to report on like the fifth principal component because, again, it does nothing, right? It's so subtle of a difference, right? Yes, you'll notice it, but not at the same time, right? So, again, now that I have these eigenvectors, again, what we can start to do is you can start to look at, well, where are the things that have the biggest impact, going on here. And specifically, you notice I'm saying biggest impact. So it's finding those calculations, those numbers that are all high versus not, uh, uh, versus um, compared to everything else, right? So you can see, uh, again, that first value or that first group has the most explanation, right? There's a lot of variables that are appearing to have high Calculations are high uh, uh, values and they're eigenvector. And so, again, that addresses the vast majority of the dietary behavior. Then, right, the second one is, so, again, that's the vast majority of that dietary behavior that everyone has of the Nepalese adults. Then that second one, right, maybe not as much, right? You notice I made my, my hand signs smaller, Right? First principal component, second principal component, third principal component, fourth principal component. At this point, right, adding another one, you know, showing you the fifth principal component isn't really going to give you much. It's going to be like, eh. It's going to be, that's how much data that we're seeing. So we don't, you know, this is where you make that decision call when you know the data. Um, Math. But what does that allow me to do? This is where we do get to have a little bit of fun, right? Because the eigenvectors have taught me the patterns, the trends, the most important elements of the data set. Okay. Well, you know, I know what the average of the data set is as well. And so if you think about what I have here, I have... What I have is, again, some, uh, I'm trying to think about what I want to present this as. I have some average value of my data sets, right, of all my attributes. I have the averages of them. And I now also have sort of the eigenvectors for them and I have multiple eigenvectors for them. Well, again, if we're thinking about variance, right? Variance was how much do I deviate from the mean? I could add or subtract. In fact, let me <laughs> add or subtract. I could add or subtract this eigenvector times some scalar value. And what does that do? It produces new data points, artificial data points that follow the same trend. This is one of those things where it's coming. I, I'm going to, this is where we get into touchy areas uh, because what happens if you use the, uh, I generate artificial data, data that does not exist. That's a method that we are currently using to train AI because I may not have a large data set, but if I can find the trends, I might be able to produce enough data to make that worthwhile, right? So these, 
you know, again, I'm, you know, I plotted out. Those are the real numbers for the, for the values we've been working with all class, right? So same ones, just slightly kind of strung out. But then you notice, right, I can follow that trend line and all of these fake values that were just applied with some multiplication and some difference of mining, minusing or subtracting, right, then what I ended up getting is fake data. Now, just to point this out, those arrows, I didn't, I didn't, I, uh, I was lazy. Uh, so that arrow is not meant to indicate like the spread. It's just more meant to indicate here's your orthogonal hyperplane. Okay, good? good. Right. But again, well, why would I want to do that? Well, again, those are trends. And remember, I talked about how what I did for my master's was artificial face aging, right? So that's where I want to take sort of the rest of today to show you, okay, we did a math equation. I showed you like uh, what you can do with it by studying it, but now what can you do with those eigenvectors, right? You reduced your dimensions down, and now I'm telling you to do more math with it? Well, this is where I'll at least start with the first thing that I did for my, uh, my dissertation, or not my dissertation, my thesis, for, uh, is I was focusing on work that was built by uh, Dr. Tim Coots. Smart guy, super smart, but specifically his work is all about this idea of trying to identify the patterns of shapes, right? Identify that shape that is his face, right? So, oh, well, wouldn't you know it? If I have a bunch of pictures, right? Again, remember, if we're dealing with a face, Right? That's how all of our faces look. Right? Good. And specifically, yes, even though the shape of the outline isn't there, what I can do is I can landmark this. And specifically, if you notice, right, that first image is, was my first paper. Was it was, let's see if we can just model blinks. Where's that? And then I had one in the nose and then up top on the eyebrows. Do I have any others? Uh, I also kind of had, I had the eyeball and then I had the lids because we were talking about blinking, whatever, right? But you notice, hey, what's the trend to these things? Because it's not just one picture, right? It's a series of pictures that I'm collecting through video, right? Because that's one version. I'm not going to draw it out, but I also have a version for those same data points. Look like this, right? The eye has closed. And so we had to mark where the eyelids are going, right? And you can do that. And you notice what we see here, right? What's the pattern? What's the deviation going on there? This is just that visualization of what happens when you blink. You all know what that is, but now we have it in a statistical model. The same thing with a hand gesture. The same thing with a head turn. Anyone want to take a stab in the dark at what this one's for? Human. Those, Those are not legs. Those are not arms. Think inside. That is not the sinus. Brain. Brain. That's MRI scans. Right? Because, hey, I can find something like a tumor or I can find uh, um, any type of major uh, uh, thing because, again, that's just fMRI scans looking at, uh, I believe, uh, different parts of the lobe. Uh, and so, again, all right, well, that's the shape model. But, right, what, what's the use for a shape model? Is just to, like, 
okay, we can find sort of the variance of a shape, right? Well, why we did that is specifically, again, if you're looking at that from faces, hands, again, that's just we now have a statistical model for a hand, a brain, a face. Why they were doing that is, again, we had to try and we were still trying to find uh, how to detect a face, right? Here's a picture uh, in a a two-dimensional plane of a graphic, right? Where's the face? That's still like that was actually very difficult to do. And so what uh, Kutz's work was doing was specifically, hey, I know that we're, we're making an assumption, this is a picture with a face in it, right? We, we accept that assumption uh, currently. Okay, well, I know the statistical model for a face. Let's slap it on the image, right? But you notice it's wrong. Well, again, notice what I can do. All right, well, that statistical model, right, it's wrong, but can we start to maybe multiply it and scale it and maybe rotate it? Because these are all just math equations, uh, points in a matrix. Can I expand this and maybe rotate it and tweak it a little bit so that it gets a little closer? And okay, how's this one look? You notice it's not quite there yet, and that's where what we essentially do is you continue to grow and tweak and grow and tweak until you hit something called convergence. Remember, convergence came, you saw convergence. That was simulated annealing. What happens to temperature? Right? You can have it just go linearly, but you could also have it just stop changing so much. Right? Oh, we're not changing anymore between our iterations, so we've hit convergence. Good so far with convergence? So we've slapped a shape onto a face. Now what? This was the next step. Since I have the shape, remember, it's just points on a plane. Yes, I have a face behind it, but this is where you get to have a little, we got we to dust off a little bit more of your linear algebra, a little bit of geometry while we're at it. Anyone familiar with Delaney's triangulation? That one hurt, right? So I'm going to skip a little bit. Delaney's triangulation. Given a point, build triangles, uh, minimize the number of triangles connecting all those points together. That is Delaney's triangulation. But notice what it does. Hey, who here has played any form of old video game? Right? You notice how you had blocky models? Blocky model. And UV mapping, when you're trying to build, this is for my game development students, for those of you who are thinking about UV mapping, well, guess what? UV mapping is just connecting, hey, this triangle goes to this polygon on the image or on the the 3D model that you're, you're simulating, right? That's just ones and zeros, mapping to that, right? So what we're doing is, well, hey, now, let's take the fact that we, we can do the same thing that we do with 3D you know, mapping of textures to a, a 3D object out there in simulation, right, video games. What's the average pixel values? Right? Those are just more numbers. Right? That's just a bunch of numbers in a triangle. Those are just ones and zeros at the end of the day because that's all a, a graphic is. So now... What's the average face look like, specifically on pixel intensity? And this, you may notice, has a very eerie, similar behavior to what you see in ChatGPT or LLM-style generated images. Now, what is it? It's soft. It's blurry. It has that kind of no texture to it, right? It's an average face. Well, averages kind of get rid of the blemishes. But, right, notice what I have here. Again, just like I saw with my shapes, I can show the variance of the shape. What if I also added not just the shape, but also now these pixel intensities? And so what you can see is, 
right? That is the average face. It looks very much like an egg. But what happens as I start to move forward a little bit? Well, you see, I kind of have sort of the mouth is open, but there's no teeth and kind of, it looks like the, the face is talking, right? That's about it, right? It's just talking. But look on the other side, right? If I look at the different direction, instead of adding, right, to this, if I went the opposite direction, I am looking and I'm seeing a little bit more of a uh, darker skin tone. Uh, I am seeing more of a smile aspect going on there. Um, potentially, this is where now I'm just like, uh, this looks like it's a masculine face. The one over on that side looked like it was much more of a feminine face, right? I'm starting to see those differences going on there. Uh, and so, again, that's where you would go in with the pixel intensity. So, again, what we're, we're doing is we're, we're combining these together. What I ended up doing, right, again, you notice I had mentioned it. I just sort of jumped very quickly to masculine face, feminine face, darker skin tone, lighter skin tone. These were just things that I said because I'm observing them in my data. And so this is where, well, hey, rather than gender or ethnicity, what if we did age? Because, again, this is where, like I was talking about at the beginning of the semester, I was, we were doing this for high-value targets and sex traffic uh, victims, right? It's people who have gone missing for multiple years, potentially. What can we simulate? Can we make a, a guess of what they look like? based on their perceived values, right? Based on statistical models of all of their different demographical data. So again, you can see, right, in this case, if we have an image or two, two different faces, right, we have sort of their, their original face, but we can also start to see, like if we are applying the same model to these individuals, just, right, they're, they look different because they are different things, you can see, Here's an estimation of what they both look like in their 80s or whatever the time range for this picture is, right? This is where my face comes into play, right? How much of this is what I will look like? That's the open question, right? Oh, you did a statistical model. Can you prove it? Right? That's yes. Uh, and we've been studying age for years. And so that's where, again, uh, just uh, because what we're, I, I forgot to mention, um, <clears throat> so this is out of Dr. Carl Rickenek's work, uh, or Rickenek. Uh, so again, we, that's, yes, right? We did kind of look at that as well. So in this case, um, uh, this uh, individual, uh, again, here's what their face synthetically looked like, and this is what their face actually looked like at that age. And, you know, hey, we've all taken pictures. We all see what we used to look like as babies, right? We live in that era now or we all have our childhoods plastered on the internet somewhere. But you can see, as you've aged, you're just starting to apply it. Now, I will admit, he looks a lot older than his simulated uh, image. Uh, but it does start to kind of get closer. So maybe if I did a comparison on this to this, maybe it's there. It's a little, you know, it's, yes, welcome to the hard part of trying to guess someone's age. If we knew how to, you know, right? Did you imagine your Snapchat filters were doing it right? No. You're just like, oh, that's silly. Yes, it's difficult. It's incredibly hard. And it gets harder when you're trying to deal with children. Why? Children have much more flexible skin. It's still young. It's still growing. It hasn't really kind of, we have this thing called um, plasticity of the skin, right? As you get older, your skin is less flexible, right? It, it, it gets the, the look, it gets the wrinkles, all that stuff. When you're a child, again, if you're thinking about this from human trafficking victims trying to find children who have been kidnapped out there in the world, it's a difficult math problem. And in fact, right, we have not solved it. So again, when you're thinking about like things to try and maybe do as like future work, uh, yeah, try and... Uh, Identify how children age. If I see a child's face, an eight-year-old, what will they look like in 10 years? Because it's, notice how they look very different 
at a certain age. My point being, uh, so here's now just a little bit of prettiness uh, because, you know, I have data. I have mappings of faces about how, you, how long ago was this? 11 years ago? 11 years ago, I essentially took uh, an average face. This is an average face, pixels of all those, how many attributes? 252 uh, attributes, or 251, I think. No, 252 landmark points on the face. And then I just busted out Python, right? I just busted out Python. There's some matplotlib. I was trying to, I wanted to, you know, build these calculations myself. I was like, I don't want to rely on Delaney's triangulation from a, uh, uh, someone else. I want to build it myself. Like, I wanted to learn it, you know. But then I was like, oh, hey, you know, there's some stuff going on here. Let me read that. Here's my data points. Let me do triangulation. But then, specifically, it is Python 2, so you're going to have to downgrade or upgrade it to Python 3 if you want to see this. But then it's just, hey, make all the, using every one of the color palettes in Python, make me them. So here's all of those faces just across different nice little uh, color schemes. My favorite one is, uh, not that one, that, was, that one's, where's, where's my pastel? Rainbow R. Yeah, I love that one right there. That's my favorite one. I actually have that uh, as a painting in my house. I really like it, right? Again, it's my life's work, or at least uh, my child's, my, my young adult's life's work. Um, but to at least kind of finish things up again, just to point these things out. Um, so I've posted a few different things as well. So this is that tutorial I told you I screamed and cursed at. Um, Again, if some part of this was not helping, you, you know, you got lost at some point, uh, this is a great tutorial, widely received, uh, Lindsay Smith. Um, there's Tim Kutz's page. The reason why I mentioned this is if you're feeling froggy, guess what? He has the software to run the calculations, so you can get the pixel, uh, the principal component pixel intensities of a, an individual graphic to make your own average faces or whatever thing you want. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Rixenek's company. He essentially spun off his work uh, from catching high-value targets because high-value targets got caught, uh, so the, the grant funding was gone. And specifically, he looks at it now from, uh, oh, crap, I'm out of time. Never mind. He looks at it from uh, an insurance standpoint now. So get out of here. I'll see you all on Wednesday.